As you know, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada released its final report a few months ago. Universities are uniquely positioned in society to help to facilitate reconciliation. In fact, it's a responsibility that we need to take on as universities. However, we know this is a challenging topic for our com community and for the nation. We want to proceed carefully and thoughtfully over time. Reconciliation, as we've been reminded many, many times, is a long, long-term process. Therefore, we've decided to begin a campus conversation, a series of discussions that the campus communi community can participate in. We hope that this is both a respectful discussion that allows us to engage in this topic, but also assist to formulate ongoing plans. And most importantly, as we, as we have heard from so many people, it needs to result in action. A way for us to continue to, to uh, focus on our strong commitment to Blackfoot, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people is through the re reconcili reconciliation recommendations. It's a way for us to engage everyone, both on campus and on ca off campus. Today, we decided to start primarily with our on-campus community because we felt it important to begin the discussion amongst our family on campus. But at the same time, we have a number of visitors here today and I'd like to welcome all of you for being here. We're very pleased that you're here. As we move through this discussion, both today and beyond, we need to support each other. So I asked the community to approach this very respectfully and to allow time to unfold. With this in mind, today I'm so pleased to be able to introduce Dr. Leroy Little Bear as our speaker that will begin our campus conversation. As I know most of you know, Leroy is a nationally and internationally recognized thought leader in Aboriginal education, rights, theories, and Blackfoot traditional knowledge and culture. Leroy is also, of course, a graduate of the University of Lethbridge. Leroy began the discussion today many, many years ago with our very first president, Sam Smith. Leroy was invited to meet with a group of faculty members and Sam Smith to begin to explore how the University of Lethbridge could become a more inclusive community. That was in the early years of this university. And as we see, as we think about reconciliation being a long-term process, almost 50 years later, we are continuing with that conversation. Leroy gave the keynote speech he will give today at the University of Saskatchewan this fall at a reconciliation uh, conference. I was very, very fortunate to be at that conference uh, sitting on a panel and had a chance to listen to Leroy give his talk. This same talk will be given at the Congress, uh, this year's Congress in Calgary, which will allow Leroy to provide a national conversation as well. So thank you, Leroy, for being here today. We're so pleased you're able to begin this discussion and uh, please come up. Thank you very much, Mike. Nistuan na kauk ikas kiniwa. He naksiks kainawa sa kita pio kaya nuhtu si peta pi. Hindi ako kitsipi nixu ko eksits pio piks. I was saying in Mongolian. that my name was Ika uh, Skinny Lohorn. I'm from the Small Ropes Band of the uh, Blood Tribe of the Blackfoot uh, Confederacy. I'm very honored to be here today and to 
share some thoughts with you. It's not very often during my long stint here at the University of Lethbridge to be able to talk to a university-wide audience. And I'm very honored by your presence. You know, uh, not too long ago, I think it was last fall, you will recall the Pope had a private audience with President Obama. And Obama, I mean the Pope, asked Obama, you know, you're one of the most powerful men in the world. What do you do when you pass or want to pass things that are not very popular with the people? And maybe you get a backlash and so on. How do you deal with that? Obama's response was, we always have a trump card. And Obama asked the Pope, what about you? He says, we issue a papal bull. <laughs> you know, there was a, uh, these two radio antennas that had been sitting on these roof of these houses that were next to each other. They'd been there for years. Finally, one of the radio antennas finally spoke to the other antenna and they said, you know, we've been here. We know each other. We're, we're about transmission of communication and so forth. We know what it's all about. We should get married. So they did. The wedding wasn't much to talk about, but they had a fantastic reception. <laughs> Dawn just caught on. <laughs> what I want to talk to you about is a profound, you know, something very profound, profound questions. Talking about profound questions, one day somebody asked the late Louis Armstrong, what is jazz? And Armstrong's response was, if you really have to ask, you'll never know. Somebody in the background said, he really blew it. <laughs> well, today, in the same way sometimes, young kids ask us these loaded questions and sometimes we kind of fumble trying to explain to these kids what it's all about. It's in that tone and from that perspective that I'd like to share some thoughts with you. I've titled my talk Big thinking, a conscience awakening, Re a rethink about who we are and where we're going. And as I've told a couple other groups, it's kind of like about 
a midlife crisis. Maybe midlife crisis is apropos for the University of Lethbridge. We're just reaching 50. But I'm using the notion of midlife crisis as an analogy because what happens in a midlife crisis? Usually somebody, person, a couple, ask themselves, geez, you know, I've been working for 40 years. And I've done this and I've done that. But where am I going? What is all what I've been doing taking me? What path am I going down? Because I've been so busy, I've never stopped to really think about it. And sometimes, people who do ask themselves those questions, they do come back and say, geez, I'm really happy with what I'm doing, and I think I'll continue. But then, We've all heard about people who have asked themselves those loaded questions and have said, I hate my job, but I'm stuck in it. I have kids to support. I have a house to pay for, so I'm stuck. But I hate my job. I don't know what to do about it. And then there are others who say, I'm going to sell everything, get rid of everything, and I'm going to go do something totally different. That's usually the kind of profound loaded questions that arise out of a midlife crisis. Well, it seems to me that The TRC presents an opportunity for us as a country, as a university, to ask ourselves those kind of loaded, profound questions. It seems to me that in Canada's history, it has not been very often where we have stopped as a nation to really ask ourselves who we are as Canadians. To give you an example, way back in the early 80s, during the constitutional days when the Constitution was brought home, we asked some top government officials, what is Canadian? You know what their response was? We're not American. In other words, we've never stopped to really think about who we are and to say, where am I going? with all this. There are opportunities, and it seems that one of those opportunities was way back in 1867 at Confederation. Confederation was really brought about by the scare, the threat, by the Americans, because they were expanding at such a fast rate. They were expanding westward. They were expanding right in here, right in this territory. You know, during the uh, buffalo days, you know, shipping hides and buffalo from over here at Fort Benton, Montana. 
That was an awakening. And it was one of those times that I think Canada kind of thought about who it was, who we really are. But there have been other opportunities. There have been other occasions. Maybe the threat of Quebec separation kind of wakes us up a little bit. But for the most part, we don't pay attention. We just kind of keep brushing things aside and we keep going. For instance, how many in the past few decades, how many commissions, how many studies, royal commission, have come to be, have been established. But we haven't paid much attention. Just, we just kind of push them aside and we keep going. In other words, we don't stop and reflect. Well, it seems to me that for one reason or another, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission is having that effect on us. So that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission really is making Canadians stop and think about who we are and why are these things happening. I'm sure, as I was telling Don McIntyre a few minutes ago, hey, you know, we just had a shooting up there at La Loche, Saskatchewan. I'm sure those people up there in a nice, closely tight community, everybody knows each other, I'm sure they're asking themselves, why did this thing happen? Why did it happen? I thought we're all neighbors. I thought everything was fine. Why is it happening? See, so the point to be made is that we can dwell, which I'm not going to, on the TRC, on the residential school experiences that, you know, they were horrific experiences. If we don't know about them, it's online, the reports. I know those, I know about those. Why? Well, because I was one of those products. Everything that had been said in those reports, in the TRC reports, are true. They're true, because I experienced them. I knew. I went to one of those schools. But, as I said, that's not really, we can dwell on that, but I want to talk about this notion, more about this notion about asking ourselves. Here's an opportunity. The TRC is giving us a wake-up call to stop and think about where we're going, who we're doing, and why do certain things happen within our nation, and within our university and societies. One may ask, what does universities have to do with all this, with residential schools? Well, in my opinion, universities and institutions of higher learning 
do have a lot to do with it. Why? Well, because it was institutions of higher learning that were turning out the Indian agents, the teachers, the priests, the nuns, the ministers, the superintendent generals of Indian affairs, such as Duncan Campbell Scott, who is famous for his saying, talking about a policy he was going to implement, we are not going to stop till there's not one Indian left. See? It was institutions of higher learning that were turning out these types of educated people. So, I take the TRC as an opportunity for us as a university, as a community, as a nation, to take advantage of that and, and ask ourselves about who we are, what are our metaphysics okay, that we operate by, and where are those metaphysics taking us. Okay. Let me give you a real brief history. It covers lots of years. As I tell my class, I'll speed up the video. You know. I'm going to go back. I was just telling another class a few weeks ago about St. Augustine, 350 AD, plus or minus. St. Augustine was having insomnia, couldn't sleep, so he got up, took out his iPhone, and what he was wrestling around with was the thought about saving the Holy Land. And, but he was running up against one of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not kill. So there was this conflict. So he wrote a note to himself, something to the effect of, it is not a sin to conduct holy wars against infidels, meaning non-Christians. And he put his iPad away and forgot about it. <clears throat> about five, seven, eight hundred years later, in the 11th century, thereabouts, the Pope of the day came across the hard drive where he found that note. And guess what? Shortly thereafter, the Crusades started. Okay? In other words, jihads, holy wars. Okay? Well, time passes by. In the 13th and 14th centuries, we had inquisitions after inquisitions, not unlike our search for terrorists, not, like, not unlike the McCarthy era, searching for communists. See? Well, <clears throat> one of those Inquisitions had to do with Muslim people, Moors, that were coming across the Mediterranean from North Africa into Southern Europe. 
some were settling in Spain and so on. And it was there that texts were being sent back and forth to Rome and to Spain about these infidels. Consequently, the Inquisition. One of, the, one of those inquisitions was coming to a closure in 1492. Most people associate 1492 with Columbus. But in the spring of 1492 was the closure of one of those inquisitions, where the church felt, I think, we're, I think we've gotten the better of the infidels, I think we'll stop, okay? Well, guess what? Columbus comes across. Who does he run into? More infidels. And I'm sure he was asking himself, oh no, not again? So, we, we kind of know the rest of the story. In the 15th, 16th century was the beginning of, was, it took hold, it had happened earlier, but it took hold. And that was the Enlightenment. I prefer to refer to it as the age of reason. And it seems to me that our institutions, our universities, are very much based on the metaphysics of age of reason. The age of reason came into existence because it was a kind of a people's movement, the commoners. Why? Well, because it was the church and it was the king. Remember the, all the king's horses and all the king's men? Okay. They were the ones that were the guardians and gatekeepers of knowledge that was not accessible to the commoners. So eventually the commoners said, well, just like some of our students say, I don't have to go to the library, I can ask Surrey. <laughs> they say, well, I don't have to go to all those church libraries and the, uh, you know, King's libraries and so on, I can come to know things strictly through pure reason. And a lot of philosophy, a lot of philosophers followed that. Kant, more contemporary times, Bertrand Russell, people like that said, we can come to know things without experience. We can come to know through pure reason. In other words, it started to become a rationalistic and mechanistic world. That's what the knowledge atmosphere was about. The age of reason gave rise to what is known as deism. Deism, in other words, the church has jumped on the bandwagon and they said the same thing. We can come to know things just through pure reason because pure reason is a God-given gift. And all we're doing is exercising that God-given gift. If you stop and think about it a little bit, 
it gave rise to what we would call propositional thinking. If any of you are in graduate school, they'll be asking you, what's your hypothesis? That's propositional thinking. See? And through propositional thinking, if I were to, you know, use science as an example. In particle physics, for instance, they talk about, the scientists are talking about, we've got a formula over here, and we've got these other formulas. But through our formulas, propositional thinking, there's supposed to be a Higgs particle right here. See, there's supposed to be one. And they think they've discovered it, although they've backed off a little bit in the past two years. But the Higgs particle, for those of you that don't know, any, know about it, was really a particle. It's really not a particle. It really is a field, a, a little electric energy field that deals with transforming energy forces into matter. See, that's what they were. And as we speak, a large hadron collider in Geneva, Switzerland, is trying to discover just that. But coming back to the age of reason, The, it brought about rationalism. It did away with the notion of subjectivity and only dealt with the objective. It did away with emotions and feelings, those kind of things. That's the reason why, for instance, women we're not very reliable when it comes to science, leadership, because they were too emotional. You know? They speak too much from intuition. Well, you can't measure that, see. We know that that's fading away. Okay? Separation of church and state came into existence. Technocracy, the technocrats, the bureaucrats, came into existence. They became, as they are today, the power brokers. See? Well, things like mysticism, miracles, ghosts, Things like that were frowned upon because those are not measurable. Measurement, and hence the role of mathematics, became the foundation of the scientific method as a result of the age of reason. Experimentation and pure reason can bring about knowledge. Now, during those days, there were a few people that did try to challenge this notion. Scientists like von Goethe was a scientist who tried to be a little bit different. And he could be referred to as a forerunner of quantum physics because he was, he, way back then, he was saying the observer and the observed are one and the same. They interact. Now, Today, 
For instance, because of the age of reason science basis, nobody wants to question my grandpa, Einstein. Yeah? I used to drink with him, you know. <laughs> but there are people, even notions of relativity, that scientists are kind of pushing aside, but nevertheless are there. Examples of that is a new theory that came out a few years ago called modified Newtonian dynamics. Modified Newtonian dynamics says, what they're saying is that, you know the speed on the outside of the, the uh, Milky Way galaxy, which we're part of, and the speed on the inside of the galaxy are the same. There's no difference. Whereas relativity says, no, the speed at the center is faster than the speed at the out on the outside. Well, if they're the same, then there's nothing relative. See? In other words, you need difference to have relativity. So in other words, those are kind of questions where people attempt to try and stop the continuous flow, say, let's stop and think about it. Well, the age of reason was in full bloom during the days of colonization here in North America. It was in full bloom. Native science was about wholeness, spirituality, waves, energy waves as opposed to particles. It was about relationships, everything being animate. But that type of thinking, because of the age of reason, was totally discounted because it was not about measurement and mathematics. All these fantastic stories you hear like dreams and so on, to the scientists and the educators, those were just tales of power. They were pushed aside. The point to be made from all this is that we as the universities, institutions of higher learning, what are our metaphysics? Okay. What do we operate by? Have we ever stopped to really examine those metaphysics and where they're taking us. Have we asked ourselves, we as homo sapiens, are we better off as a result of the age of reason and all its ramifications? Are our universities really advancing the cause of knowledge and its transmission to the younger generation. Well, <clears throat> using science as an example, quantum physics has come into the picture. And science, it seems, has moved on. Even the law has changed its thinking. Let me quote our Chief Justice McLaughlin about what she says about the law and about our society. Quote, 
During the 19th century, and for a large part of the 20th century, Canada can best be described as a small, agricultural, Caucasian, Christian society. Its structures rested upon a spiritual, on upon, upon a virtually unquestioned core of shared common values. We are no longer essentially a Caucasian country. One only has to walk streets of our major cities, Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver, Ottawa, to realize that we are a country of mixed race. All we have to do is listen to the news about the Assyrians coming to our country. To realize that we are a country of mixed race. In this newly cosmopolitan um, Canada, issues arising from divergence of race and culture increasingly find their way into our legal system. In some, Canadian society has experienced a revolution in recent decades. However, quiet and incipient may have been its passage. Our society is large, diverse, and multifaceted. It is no longer homogeneous. While we can still speak of shared values, we find ourselves in conf increasingly con confronted by conflict between divergent sets of shared values, unquote. In other words, are our universities going through the same type of exercise and reflection as the Supreme Court? It seems science, as a result of quantum physics, has moved on. Per McLaughlin's statement, the law is moving on, leaving behind the age of reason principles. Are our universities moving on too? Or are we hanging on to the old principles of the age of reason? Way back when, the church and the king's horses and all the king's men were the guardians and gatekeepers of knowledge. It seems that since the age of reasons, the universities have taken over that role, guardians and gatekeepers of knowledge. University education is about pushing what I refer to as the envelope. In other words, if this is the boundary of what we know, university education is trying to push the boundary into the unknown so we can make new discoveries. It is about the transmission of knowledge, knowledge that cultiv cultivates the powers of the mind. It is about empowering the younger generation with skills and creativity to become contributors to our society. True university education is not about employment. Employment training is what technical schools and community colleges, that's what they do. That is their mandate. 
And they do a good job of it. I always tell my classes, if you're coming over here to get trained for a job, maybe you're in the wrong place. We're about knowledge. We're not about training for a job. The present generation of university educators, it seems, confuse the real purpose of universities with, with skills training. Now, why is that happening? That's because it comes from and arises out of the ivory syndrome, you know, ivory tower syndrome, ivory tower criticism. The ivory tower criticism is basically about the population out there saying, geez, if, if there's so much knowledge within those concrete walls, what is all that knowledge good to us? What is it, how does it benefit us? See? Well, the universities, so to speak, if I can put words in their mouth, basically say, hey, you know, university, you know, our job is about pushing this envelope, delving into the unknown so we can eventually come to know more. Discovery after discovery after discovery is not possible on an everyday yearly basis. See, we need the luxury of time. But if you, the community, are impatient and want some immediate benefit, okay, we'll respond to that. Their response has been, we'll turn out teachers for you. We'll turn out the engineers. We'll turn out the doctors. We'll turn out the lawyers. In other words, the professions, the professional schools, while we continue our search into the unknown. Say, that's been kind of the uh, response by the universities to the ivory tower criticism. Well, the thing is, now, the ivory, the ivory tower criticism is now coming from a new group asking the same question. If there's so much knowledge behind those concrete walls, what good is it to us? The new group is, of course, the Aboriginal people. Being expressed through the TRC, through all these commissions and studies. So I guess the question for us as a university is, what do we do about it? That was the challenge that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission threw out to Canadians and more specifically to the universities. What are you guys going to do about it? So I guess we leave you with that question. What are we going to do about it? Incidentally, University of Lethbridge was well ahead of it, kind of ahead of it, the times of Native Studies. It was one of the first schools to really jump into it wholeheartedly. We gave it our all. 
It was one of our, as one of our colleagues over here put it to me, it was a swagger we can carry around. But the question now is, do we still have that swagger? Hope, hopefully we do. University of Lethbridge used to be regularly mentioned in the McLean's yearly studies for Native American studies. That doesn't happen anymore. Haven't seen it in the past few years. See? Is it because we're resting a little bit on our laurels? You know? Or is it because everybody else is catching up? See? But the TRC, as we said, provides us with an opportunity to have a little bit of that midlife crisis, you know, for us to stop and think, hey, what are our metaphysics? What is it that we're running with? And are those metaphysics still serving us well? Okay. Just like the movement that brought about the age of reason, the commoners having access, saying, we don't have to have access to those libraries and so on. Well, isn't that what's happening with Surrey? In other words, hey, a lot of people are starting to say, maybe I don't have to go to university. I can get the answer. See? And if that's the case, it would seem to me that we need to think about that so that our institution is something that'll be relevant for another 50 years. Thank you very much. <laughs>